Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's readings come from The Life, Travels and Literary Career of Bayard Taylor. This is a biographical book written by Russell H. Conwell about the life of American poet Bayard Taylor. Taylor was also a literary critic, translator, travel author and diplomat. He lived a full life and died in 1878. My name is Teddy, and I aim to help people everywhere get a good night's rest so they can have a productive day and achieve what they need to achieve. I read a different story every episode to help you get a good night's rest. It is designed to play in the background as you slowly fall asleep. Every episode tells a different story, and you're welcome to listen to whichever one works for you. Special thank you to iTunes listeners for the kind words you left during the week. Philly's Laptop, Lash Loves A, FWM123. I appreciate each of the kind words you left, and I'm glad to know that it's helping. This podcast is helping a lot of people, and I love hearing from listeners about it. My goal with this podcast is to help people everywhere get a good night's rest, but I do need your help to do this. Please jump into iTunes or your podcast player of choice. Subscribe and leave a review. You would be surprised at how helpful this is. It's a really small thing, but does have a big impact. In the meantime, lie back, relax, and enjoy the readings. The Life, Travels, and Literary Career of Bayard Taylor Chapter 1 The nearness and magnitude of Bayard Taylor's life make it one exceedingly difficult to comprehend and classify. His adventures were so many, his struggles so severe, his experience so varied, and his final success so remarkable that the materials are too abundant and often serve to clog and confuse the student of his career. An artist who views the mountain from its base loses many of the finest effects and most charming outlines because of his very close proximity to them. So in looking upon the wonderful career of such a versatile and gifted man at a time so near his death, we are less able to form a comprehensive idea of his life as a symmetrical whole than we shall when the years have carried us farther away from him and the outlines of his greatness are more distinct. Whether it were better to wait until a part of the life has been forgotten and wait until the more harsh and angular features have been lost in the general outline, or whether it were more desirable to describe the life in all its actual details, and in the natural ruggedness which the close view reveals is, however, a mere matter of taste, To those who love to read of a man in whose work there was no unevenness, and in whose experience nothing unbroken is seen, the life of one so long dead that the writer is compelled to fill up the forgotten years with ideal events and motives may furnish the choicest theme. 
but to those students who love scientific scrutiny, who would estimate the life for what it really was worth as an example, the biography which is written amid all the facts and by one who comes in actual contact with them, is perhaps esteemed the most valuable, although as a whole less symmetrical, Bayard Taylor's life was rugged and cragged with startling events when viewed from the kindly poetical standpoint of his character. He felt all the extremes of joy and sorrow. He knew all the pains and honours of poverty and wealth. He was loved by many. He was betrayed by many. He lived in the most enlightened lands. He also sojourned among the most barbarous people. He saw man in peace and in war. He rode the ocean in calm and in storm. He was the welcomed guest in the lowliest huts and in the most gorgeous palaces. He sweltered in the sands of tropical deserts and he was benumbed by the fierce winds of the northern ice fields. He boldly entered the haunts of wild beasts and loved the company of harmless and faithful domestics. He was a man of many virtues and some faults each of which made his life more eventful and fascinating. The literary position which he held at the time of his death, and which was so romantically attained, was one of almost universal favour. He was respected by all and loved by many. As a writer of fiction, he attained but little celebrity and it appears that he had little expectation of achieving any high honours in that field. As a writer upon travels and a delineator of human character as found in strange places, and in but partially known countries, he was second to none. His books upon travel will read for a century to come, whether thousands or few visit the localities and tribes he has described. As an orator, he never held a high rank. He was chaste, concise, and clear in his choice of words, and had an incisive, pungent way of stating his ideas. He could instruct the student and amuse the populace, but had not the power to agitate and carry away large bodies of men, and seems never to have been very ambitious to do so. As a translator of German literature, he was fast becoming recognised in all English-speaking countries as an excellent authority, and it is deeply to be regretted that he was called away with so many uncompleted translation and unfinished plans for translations from the standards of German literature. But it is as a poet that he receives the greatest homage, yet how little he printed... Unless there shall be found laid away many poems unpublished, he may be classed as one of the least prolific poets of his generation. His lines are so simple, so true to life. Such incarnate sentences so expressive that to one who has had a similar experience with the poet, Every stanza is a panorama, vivid and indelible. We shall see as we pursue the tale how sensitive he was to everything poetical 
and how deeply he was moved by all those finer and more subtle emotions which only a poet can feel. His love was deep and abiding, his friendship like the oaks of his cedarcroft woodland. His old home was to him the sweetest place in all the beautiful lands he saw. His life was full of romantic incidents, and he recognised them and appreciated them for the poetry they suggested. We venture to say that his poetry will live in every household if all his other works should be forgotten. Chapter 2 The ancestry of Bayard Taylor were connected with some of the best blood of England and Germany. His grandmothers were both German and his grandfathers both English. The German line comes from that body of emigrants consisting of large numbers from Weimar, Jena, Cassel, Gottingen, Hanover and perhaps Gotha, who sailed from Bremen and Hamburg between 1730 and 1745. The continued quarrels among the dukes and princes of Germany the wars in progress and impending, wherein the peace of the people was incessantly disturbed, caused a universal uneasiness among the people of those small nations. They never were quite sure of a day's rest. If they sowed unmolested, there was a grave doubt whether some complication with France, England or Poland might not bring foreign invaders or allies to destroy or devour the crops. The wars were so incessant and the quarrels among the petty lords so frequent that the people became disheartened. They were weary of building for others to destroy and of rearing sons to be sacrificed to some individual's ambition. All those German provinces or duchies had to accommodate themselves to the religion of their princes, and at times the winds that played about the hills of the Black Forest were less uncertain. To the fathers of these emigrants who sought America as a haven of religious and political rest, George Fox and his Quaker disciples had taught the doctrines of the Holy Spirit, and under various guises the tenets of that belief still survived in the German heart. Those Germans who settled in the counties of Pennsylvania, lying to the south and southwest of Philadelphia, came to this country during the disturbances in the fatherland caused by Augustus, Maria Theresa, Frederick and the scores of other princes who were in power, or seeking to secure it, in the numerous states and free cities of Germany. It is no light excuse, no desire for mere wealth, no hasty search for the fountains of youth that causes the solid, earnest, patriotic people of Saxony, Baden or Bavaria to leave forever the home of their nativity. It is a little curious to see how these races, which so cordially and hospitably received the Quaker missionaries from England, should at last unite with them in the settlement of the New World, and by their intermarriage produce such offshoots as the united stock as Bayard Taylor and his contemporaries. The Quaker ancestry of the poet 
the tailors and the ways run back through a line of industrious men and women, more or less known in central Pennsylvania, to the colony which William Penn sent over from England to cultivate the great land grant, which King Charles II of England gave him in consideration of his father's services as admiral in the British Navy. They too were driven from their homes by the incessant turmoil, either of wars or religious persecutions. Their preachers had again and again been imprisoned, while some had died the death of martyrs, Even Penn himself was often in chains and in prison for being a peaceable believer in the truth of the Quaker doctrines, but so blameless were the lives of these people and so forgiving their Christian behaviour that the term Quakers, which was at first applied to them in derision, became at last a title of respect and honour. The fear of the Lord did make us quake was a common expression with George Fox, the founder of the sect and the name Quakers originated in sneers at that devout sentence. It is easy to trace in the history of the state of Pennsylvania the influence of the Quaker spirit and its impression upon the institutions of the American nation is also strikingly apparent. But when one takes up the life of one of their descendants and studies his habits, his style of thought and his ideas of social and political institutions the hereditary Quaker element in a modified form is detected in every motion and expression. It would seem as if any reader to whom the author is unknown would detect at once in any volume of Taylor's poetry or travels the fact that he came from Quaker stock As will be more clearly shown in a subsequent chapter, the teachings of the Quakers and their manner of expression by gesture and phrase have unconsciously and charmingly crept into the bosom of his best works. It is a great boon to be born of such a physical and mental combination as that of the German soldiers with all their coolness and bravery, and the even-tempered, God-fearing Quakers, with all their grace and wisdom. Such intermixture has given to our young nation much of its surprising enterprise and originality, and must at last, when consolidated into a compact people, produce a nation and a race wholly unlike any other on earth. It is not known that any of Bayard Taylor's ancestry were literary men, or that any of them were endowed with special genius, beyond that which was necessary to clear the forests, cultivate the soil, manage manufacturing enterprises and carry on small mercantile establishment. Solid people with wide common sense, industrious hands and generous hearts, they have modestly held their way, doing their simple duty and Quaker-like making no display. Chapter 3 Bayard Taylor was born at Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, January 11, 1825. His mother, whose maiden name was Rebecca Way, was then 29 years of age and his father was 31. 
The house then occupied was a two-storey stone and mortar structure, such as are yet very common in the farming regions of central Pennsylvania. The house was long and narrow, having a porch that extended along the whole front. The rooms were small and low, but it was considered by the farmers of that time as a very comfortable and respectable home. It was located at the junction of two highways and near the centre of the little hamlet called the Square and sometimes called the Village, but few families resided there in 1825 and the people were all more or less engaged in the cultivation of the soil. The little rude Quaker meeting house, so box-like and cold in its aspect, was doubtless the centre of attraction, and the desire to be near the house of God led those devoted Quakers to build their dwellings on that portion of their lands which lay nearest to the church. The village has increased in growth and now has a population of six or seven hundred, with several churches belonging to other denominations and very flourishing schools but the old homestead building in which Bayard was born was destroyed by fire in 1876. At the time of his birth, his father kept a miscellaneous stock of merchandise in one room of his house and supplied the necessities of the farmers so far as the small capital of a country store could anticipate their wants. Situated 35 miles from Philadelphia, to which place he was compelled to send the produce he received, and in which place he purchased his simple stock of goods, the merchant had a task on his hands which cannot be appreciated or understood in these days of railways, telegraphs and commercial travellers. One of his neighbours, living in 1872, used to relate how Mr Taylor, having had a call for two hay rakes, which he could not supply, drove all the way to Westchester, the distance of a dozen miles to get those tools for his customer. At the time of Bayard's birth, his parents had been married seven years. Their life had already been subject to many trials and was fated to meet many more. Of a family of ten children, only one half the number survived to see mature years the losses by mercantile ventures, by falling crops, by sickness and accidents often swept away the hard earnings of many a month. Yet they struggled on, industrious and cheerful, keeping themselves and their children ever busy. When Bayard was two or three years old, His father purchased a farm about a mile from the village and giving up his mercantile avocations, turning his whole attention to farming. On that farm, Bayard spent the opening years of his life and on one section of it did he build his beautiful home of cedar craft. How deeply he loved his home, how sincere his affection for the rolling fields, the chestnut and the walnut woodland, the old stone farmhouse and the clumsy barn, the old highway, the acres of corn and wheat, the distant village and its quaint old church 
can be seen in a thousand expressions finding place in his published works. His poetical nature opened to his view beautiful landscapes and charming associations, which others would not detect. The birds sang in an intelligible language. The leaves on the corn entered into conversation. The lowing of the cows could be interpreted. And the rocks were romantic storytellers. He loved them all. That farm was his mecca in all his travels. When he left, he says he promised bird, beast, trees and knolls that he would return to them. To the writer, who went to Cedarcroft after the poet's death, and who has long loved and admired his poetry, it seemed as if the trees patiently awaited his return. All things in nature must have loved and trusted him, or they would not have confided to him so many of their secrets. There must be many things in the events of common life which find no voice in poetry, as every life has its prose side. At all events, there were some duties connected with agricultural work which young Bayard never enjoyed. He never was ambitious to follow the plough or do the miscellaneous odd jobs which perplex and weary a farmer's boy. Yet like Burns, he worked cheerfully and wrung more or less poetry out of every occupation. He was a spare, wiry, nervous boy, quick at work, study or play, and consequently had many leisure moments when other boys were drudging along with ceaseless toil. His schoolmates and the only school teacher now living in 1879, who taught him in his boyhood, all agree that he was a mischievous boy. He loved practical jokes and, in fact, jokes of every kind but he was ceaselessly framing verses. When his lesson was mastered, which was always in an incredibly short space of time after he took up his book, he plunged recklessly into poetry. Verses about the teacher, about snowbanks, about buttercups, about pigs, about courting, funerals, church services... Schoolmates and countless other themes filled his desk, pockets and hat. Often he wrote love letters, couched in the most delicate phraseology, and signing the name of some classmate to them, would send them to astonished ploughboys and blushing maidens. One old gentleman in Westchester, Pennsylvania, always claimed that a set of Bayard's burlesque verses sent out in that way induced him to court and marry a girl with whom he had no acquaintance until the explanation of his tender epistle was demanded by her father. What volumes of poetry he must have written which never saw the type and how much more of that which he was in the habit of repenting to himself was left unwritten. The life he led from his earliest school days until he was 15 years of age was that of every farmer boy in America who is compelled to work hard through the spring summer and autumn, and attend the district school in the winter. The only remarkable difference between Bayard and many other boys was found in his strong desire to read, and his genius for poetry, 
He gathered the greater part of his youthful education from books, which he read at home and by himself. He had a noble father and a lovely mother. God blessed them, and they made it as easy for Bayard as they could in justice to other children. They might not have fully understood the signs of genius which he displayed, but they put no needless stumbling blocks in his way. No better proof of this is needed than the excellent record of the other children, all of whom hold enviable positions in society. One brother, Dr. J. Howard Taylor, is a physician and connected with the health department of the city of Philadelphia. Another, William W. Taylor, is a most skillful engineer, while a third, Colonel Frederick Taylor, was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg when leading the celebrated Bucktail Regiment of Pennsylvania. Two sisters are living. Mrs. Annie Carey, wife of a Swiss gentleman, and Mrs. Lamborn, wife of Colonel Charles B. Lamborn of Colorado. Growing up in such a family as an elder brother, involved much patient toil and great responsibility. The best tribute to him in those days was paid by an old lady of reading, Pennsylvania who knew him in his youth and who summed up her evidence to the writer in the words, He did all he could. Chapter 4 Joseph Taylor was too intelligent and observing not to notice how unfit was his son Bayard for tending sheep, hoeing corn and weeding beds of vegetables. The intellectual inclination exhibited by the boy in every undertaking and his frail form led Mr. and Mrs. Taylor to look about for some occupation for their son more fitting than the hard drudgery of a farm. The eagerness with which he devoted himself to the study of such books as could then be secured His schemes for obtaining volumes considered by his parents until then, wholly beyond their reach, his poems and essays, learned in the hayfield and written out after the day's work was done, all confirmed them in the feeling that it was their duty to give up his assistance on the homestead and permit him to follow the leading of his genius. It was with little or no anxiety that they sent him away to school, for they felt then that they might not have their son as a companion at home again. Mr. Gores then taught an excellent high school at Westchester, the county seat, and to that they sent him for a short time. One of his classmates at that school, now residing in Baltimore, says he remembers distinctly how awkward and rustic Bayard appeared when he first entered the school, and how radical and rapid was the change from the ploughboy to the student's. He became a universal favourite, and was so able to teach and so ready to help, that he had a large number of scholars following him about half the time, for the purpose of getting assistance at their lessons. Yet he found much time to read other books than those containing his studies, and as in a village of the size of Westchester, there were some small libraries his desire for reading could be gratified. Geography was his favourite study, and in the pursuit of information, 
He sought out and read so many books relating to the places mentioned in the textbook that his classmates used to say that Bayard knows all about his geography without even reading his lessons over. He was soon well acquainted with the history of the world and the most interesting events connected with the wars of Europe fresh in his mind. He read about Edinburgh, London, Paris, Berlin and Dresden of William the Conqueror, Peter the Great, Charlemagne and Mohammed, of the adventures of the Crusaders, of the Wars of the Roses and the Thirty Years' War and Napoleon's campaigns and with each volume built higher those castles in the air, which many youths construct on the excitement of such themes. It seems astonishing how a boy of 14 years could appreciate so much of the books he read. When we recall the dullness and dryness which characterise almost every history then extent, and the exceedingly difficult subjects which they treated. He read one day for a few minutes in Unionville in 1839 from a book that lay on the mantel shelf and although the subject was that of art and the beauty of Raphael's Madonna and Child, he understood it so well and remembered it so clearly that in 1845, when at Dresden, where the picture was exhibited, he was able to recall the words of that description and the name of the writer. The circumstances in which his parents were placed made it impossible for them to support him long at school, neither was he inclined to be a charge upon them. He desired to be able to earn money for himself, both to relieve his parents of the expense and to furnish means for purchasing books. He was a bold youth. He seemed to fear nothing. He had a sublime faith in his own success, which was not egotism nor pride but an inspiration. Very often, when he had read a book, he would sit down and write to the author, which fact was not, in itself, so astonishing as the fact that he wrote letters, so bright and sensible, that in nearly every case he obtained a courteous and often a lengthy reply. In this way, he made the acquaintance of many men well known in the literary circles of America, several of whom were of great assistance to him a few years after. When he was but ten years old and still on the old farm, he read Pencilings by the Way, which was a narrative of foreign travel written by Nathaniel P. Willis and published in the New York Mirror, of which Mr. Willis was then an associate editor. Young Bayard soon after entered into correspondence with Mr. Willis on literary matters and continued the interchange of letters until the death of Mr. Willis in 1867. In the same manner, young Bayard secured the attention, advice and assistance of Rufus W. Griswold, who edited The New World and The New Yorker, and who in 1842 and 1843 edited Graham's magazine in Philadelphia. Dr. Griswold was also a poet, and in fact had been in every branch of literary work, from writing items in Boston for a weekly paper, through typesetting, reporting, and compiling, 
to writing sermons as a Baptist minister. He had led a wandering life, had seen much of the world, and was well acquainted as an editor and reviewer with all the best works of history, travel, and poetry. From him, Bayard received much sensible advice and much encouragement. To him, Bayard sent some of his earliest poems and thus secured the publication. And that concludes tonight's readings. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you're feeling drowsy. I look forward to bringing you another episode very soon. In the meantime, feel free to listen to any of the other episodes and good night.